if if something doesn't work please let me know and uh, please also ask questions uh, interrupt me uh, for asking questions if if uh, if you want to um okay great uh, so thank you for inviting me here it would have been a uh, it would have been great if i could have been there in person but uh, such are the days we uh, we live in um it's also a great honor to to speak at this conference um which uh, which celebrates professor walschmidt's 75th birthday so uh, happy birthday uh, i um, uh, several years ago I, I heard a series of lectures by uh, professor walschmidt in in tifr um at that time i wasn't thinking much about uh, transcendence problems and i, I don't uh, yeah I, i don't have any insight into them but after that i have uh, from uh, from time to time uh, thought about these problems and it's they are incredibly hard so, uh anyway so uh, yeah it's it's a great honor to to speak at a conference celebrating uh, his birthday okay uh, so i'll i'll talk about uh, rumor stark units and hilbert's 12th problem so this is all joint work with samit das gupta from duke um so first i'll introduce uh, brumer stark units um tell you something about their existence uh, what uh, what they imply for hilbert's 12th problem so in particular i'll tell you what hilbert's 12th problem is um and then uh, uh i'll 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 uh, present a result that can be thought of as a periodic solution to hilbert's 12th problem okay. so that's that's the plan um yeah there will not be any proofs in this uh, in this talk unfortunately um and i have not put pauses on my slides because i'm unsure how uh quickly or slowly they change in online talks so that's why i decided not to put pauses and so it's all one slide this is not my usual uh, preferred way of uh, making slides but uh, here it is okay so let me start with a very classical theorem from um, 19th century stickelberger's theorem uh, so what this so you start with a with with an abelian uh, feel so an abelian extension of rational numbers uh, so i'll only do it in a very special case so cyclotomic uh, feel so mth cyclotomic feel mu m here is the uh, uh, group of mth roots of 1 and h is h is the field obtained by joining all the mth roots of 1 to q uh, so of course we know that any kronecker weber theorem says that any abelian extension is contained in such a uh, field h okay depending on the conductor of the, the field that we start with uh, but let me just so so this stickelberger's theorem can also be stated for that and the statement isn't much different but let me stick to this uh, this case then we know that the galois group of uh, h over q is canonically isomorphic to z mod mz okay so there is an isomorphism which sends uh, any element in z mod mz to to the element of galois group which sends mth root of uh, any mth root of 1 to its cth power okay so this is for all mth roots of 1 so this is for all uh, zeta m in mu m okay i don't know why this is so dark uh, yeah so you yeah, not sure what is okay all right so <clears throat> so that's the canonical isomorphism then stickelberger defined this uh, this group ring element uh, which i'll call theta h over q and even so this this theta and its uh, generalization to totally real fields they'll play a important role in uh, uh, in in this whole talk okay so i'll this will um the same thing will appear again and again so theta h over q it has this very explicit expression so you sum over all elements in z mod mz star uh 1 by 2 minus c by m so what is this curly bracket it just means fractional part of x so um so element uh in uh in 
closed interval zero, open interval one, which uh, so that uh, x minus curly x is an integer. Curly bracket x is an integer. Okay, and and then this is the element of the Galois group. So so this is an element of QG, the group ring with coefficients in rational numbers. So that's my that's one of my objects. Uh, uh, it's a, so this will be related to L functions, as I'll tell you uh, soon. So this is related to L functions. So this is an analytic object. And on the other side, I have an algebraic object. So this is the ideal class group of H. Okay. So fractional ideals of H modulo principal fractional ideals. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, so this is a Z, so Galois group of H over Q acts on uh, fractional ideals and it, it uh, uh, takes principal ideals to principal ideals. So it therefore it acts on the ideal class group. So CL of H is a ZG module, okay? And uh, one of the basic sort of problems in uh, that we want to understand is the structure of class group. Well, not just as a abstract abelian group, but also as a mod, as a Galois mod. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's one of our aims. So, um, so Stickelberger's theorem tells you something towards this aim. Okay, it says that if you multiply theta h over q uh, theta h h over q by some element in in q g, so that it actually lands inside z g. Okay, it doesn't make sense uh, to consider CL of H as a QG module, right? So, because CLH is a, is a finite group, so, so there's not uh, much to do there. Uh, so, if you if you if some multiple of theta lands inside ZG, then that multiple annihilates the class group. Okay, so anything. So, so in uh, for instance, on the next slide, uh, I'll tell you that uh, in fact M. Uh, if m is even or 2m, so let me write 2m here, uh, theta h over q uh, is actually in zg. Okay, so, so for example, this particular element will annihilate the, uh, the ideal class group of h. Okay, so it tells you something about, uh, uh, about the Galois structure of this class group. Okay, so this is from 1890. I'll tell you and say a word about how this is proved. So I'm just repeating Stickelberger's theorem here on the next slide. Uh, so any multiple of theta h that lands inside zg actually annihilates the class group. <clears throat> so this has something to do with Gauss sums, and um, uh, but let me let me go the other way. You know, uh, so. How, so the way Stickelberger proved this theorem is by fact by by looking at um, uh, he he looked at the ideal generated by Gauss sums in, uh, inside H and he uh, factorized that ideals into a product of prime ideals okay um, and he noticed that this is uh, this is the kind of factorization we get and so that's that's how he proved uh, the theorem. I am going to go the other way around because this is this is what one does um, uh, for uh, totally real fields which are different from rational numbers. Okay, so if I take yeah, as I said, if uh, m times uh, something annihilates um, m m times theta lies in Z g. So I think I'm already assuming that m is even here. So let me say m even. It doesn't matter because uh, if m is odd, then q mu m q mu m is same as q mu two m. So so I might as well assume m is even. Um, so this lands uh, in in z g, and if I let it act on any prime ideal in H, then I should get a principal ideal. Right? This is what it. This is what the theorem says that uh, if you take any uh, uh, fractional ideal in in uh, of H. And you let m times theta uh, act on it, you get a principal ideal. So, so, so its class is uh, is trivial inside the class group. Okay, so you get a you get a principal ideal, and you can you can choose a generator of this. So of course, there's an ambiguity of of unit, but you can choose a generator. You can choose a generator in such a way that uh, this is uh, it's actually a Gauss sum. Okay, so um, so I'm going to yeah. So, so this is the Gauss sum. Um, 
another way so this is kind of uh, the reverse way in, uh, uh, of what how stickelberger uh, thought about this so he he would take this a particular ideal generated by gaussum and he would factorize it uh, in into prime ideals and that's how so that's how you get the uh, that's how you that's how he proved his theorem okay um now why are these uh, well gaussums are relevant for many purposes but one of the things is they generate abelian extensions of uh, q uh, in particular you can show that by taking all of them together you get the maximal abelian extension uh, of q uh, i'll make this a little bit more precise for general totally real fields so this that statement uh, will include this um, okay what i mean by by taking all of them together uh, but the, this is the this is the relevance for us. Okay, the maximal abelian extension of Q is generated by Gaussians, and this is the uh, this is the I mean this is more or less the content of kronecker weber theorem that uh, Q ab is generated by uh, taking all roots of one. Okay, you take all roots of uh, of one, and and that generates the maximal abelian extension of Q. Um, so, uh, of course, this problem has a very interesting history. Um, so, Kronecker uh, stated it and then Weber gave a proof, which was not quite uh, uh, correct, but the first correct proof of this was given. Uh, I mean, Weber's proof can be fixed, but it was not fixed until much later. Uh, so, the first correct proof was given by Hilbert in 1896. So his proof was different from Weber's proof. Um, so anyway, Hilbert uh, asked for a generalization of this to other number fields, okay? So this is what he said in his ICM address in, in 1900 in Paris. The theorem that every abelian number field arises from the realm of rational numbers by composition of fields of roots of unity is due to Kronecker. Uh, and then he said, well, imaginary quadratic field is the next level. So, uh, so how do we generate that? And that was, uh, this was probably already uh, clear how that was done, but the, the proof was completed in 1920s with the work of Takagi and Hasse and so on. Then I said, finally, the extension of Kronecker's theorem to the case uh, where you um, take any number field instead of rational numbers or imaginary quadratic field uh, seems to be of greatest importance. Okay? So, uh, and, and so he was probably thinking about complex analytic functions to, to get, uh, uh, get a generalization of uh, Kronecker-Weber theorem. And we are very far away from that as far as I can understand. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a periodic uh, solution uh, to, to, prob to this problem for totally real fields. So if you, uh, if you allow me to, uh, if you grant me a, a, a somewhat generous um, uh, interpretation of uh, Hilbert's uh, question, then then we have a periodic analytic solution to this. Okay, uh, so that's a bit of a digression about what Hilbert's twelfth problem was uh, is. I mean, and then uh, uh, yeah. So now let me get back to our element theta, the Stickelberger element. So this is related to uh, L values in a very precise way. So remember that this is an element of uh, of QG. Okay, this is an element in the group ring. So in particular, if I take any uh, character, so chi is a character um, uh, from G to complex numbers or, or QP bar, if you like. So let me write QP bar because soon I'll, uh, yeah, later in the talk, I'll probably think about these as elements of, uh, of uh, periodic uh, fields. So if chi is any uh, element like this, then you can evaluate. So you get an extension of this from QG to Q, Q bar, okay? So in particular, I can evaluate my, uh, my theta at chi, okay? And I should get a number out of it, a complex number uh, or, or, or an element in Q bar. So you fix embeddings of Q, Q bar in C and, and QP bar and so on. Okay, then this uh, number should be the L value of chi inverse at zero. There's some decoration with S here. It simply means that I don't take Euler factors uh, at primes in S. 
and I'm not taking Euler factor at the, at the infinite place. Okay, so there are no gamma factors in particular. And so, so that's what S means. I'll, I'll define this in a moment in, in a more general situation. But uh, this, is, uh, this is a defining property of the Stickelberger element. Of course, in case of Q, it has a very explicit expression as we just saw, uh, um, but, uh, but we don't have a, an explicit expression for other totally real fields. Um, and so we are going to define it using L, L values, okay? So we are going to use this relation now. So uh, let's move on to the general case. So what is the general case? I replace my Q by, by F. So this, is, uh, this replaces Q. And I replace my, uh, uh, um, uh, my cyclotomic field Q mu M by a finite abelian CM extension of F. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if you like, you can think of this as just the uh, ring class field of conductor M. Okay. Ring class field of some conductor M. M, M is a um, uh, in, integral ideal in F and you can just take the ring class field of conductor M. Um, uh, M times all the uh, Archimedean places of F. So H is a CM field. Okay. Now, um, and I put G again for Galois group of H over F. So just as before, and instead of this S, I take all fine, uh, I, take, uh, I take a set S, which contains all primes that ramify in H, as well as all the Archimedean places. So this is uh, analogous to, to what I took my S as. Now, there's one new thing that's coming up here. Uh, which just makes the whole uh, the, the statements nicer. It might look a bit technical, but this is uh, uh, so so we don't have to we don't have to take this kind of thing where, where you know you take theta times qg intersected with zg. So to avoid this kind of um, awkward uh, statement, we 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 take this finite set T. It satisfies certain properties. So first of all, it's disjoint from S. Okay, that's one property. And then there's a mild condition on T. So uh, one way of stating one of the uh, sufficient conditions is that T contains at least two primes of distinct residue characteristic. Okay, so T contains primes of dif distinct residue characteristic. Um, so that's, uh, uh, or you can have T to contain a prime of large enough residue characteristic. So that's also fine, but let's stick with this. So T contains at least two uh, primes. Um, so in particular, T is non-empty. Then I have uh, more decoration for my uh, L value. So LS was just as before, I'm not including Euler factors in S. And then there's this uh, something T, so this is called T smoothing. Okay, so the term here is kind of uh, S depleted and T smoothed L function. Okay. All right, so what is this? You take, so these are the usual Euler factors. So I'm, I'm just including Euler factors at places which are not in S. So in particular, there are no gamma factors, right? Because all the Archimedean places are in S. And then at T, I more or less have something like an Euler factor, but not quite. Um, there's then one minus S here, and it's not even the Euler factor of the, uh, of the thing that appears on the other side of the functional equation. It's slightly different from that. But this is the thing that you have to take. Uh, the reason is that this, uh, this thing kind of annihilates the, the group of roots of unity in H. Uh, so this makes uh, makes uh, this gives us integrality. Anyway, moving on. So now, as I said, there is no explicit expression for Stickelberger element in general uh, for totally real fields. So we define it using L values. Okay. So if we define it using the things that we want to understand these L values. So we take the theta s t h over f as the unique element in C G. So that whenever you evaluate it at a character uh, of G, you get this L value out of it, okay? 
uh, at the moment i'm making no claim about uh, about this l value being non zero or anything uh, this is uh, it's just whatever it is so so this uh, yeah i should have said here this is for real part of s bigger than 1 and then it has a uh, uh, meromorphic continuation to complex numbers, and in particular, it is defined at, at zero. Uh, so, so this number makes sense, and, and uh, our Stickelberger element is defined in uh, by this property. Okay, so this is the uh, Stickelberger element for totally real fields. Of course, you can at this moment. I don't need to uh, restrict myself to totally real fields. Um, uh, so everything, everything up to here makes sense uh, for uh, for any um, number field. Uh, the point is that if you don't have totally real fields, then uh, so if f is not totally real and h is not CM, then theta st uh, h over f turns out to be zero. Okay, it turns out to be the zero element. Uh, so so we might as well restrict to. Uh, the situation where things uh, are non-trivial. Okay, so that's why I restricted to totally real fields. All right. So, um, so what can we say about this theta st? Of course, when q, f was q, we had a nice uh, expression which told us automatically that uh, it is an element in q g. Well, the same thing is true. This theta st h over f is an element of q g. Uh, and that was proved by uh, Siegel, Klingen, and Shintan. Okay, so Siegel and Klingen proved it using Eisenstein series. Uh, Shintani proved it using uh, what are called um, explicit formulae for Shintani zeta functions. So we expressed uh, these L values in terms of Shint uh, Shintani zeta functions, and then he proved that those uh, take rational values at zero. Okay, um, and so. Um, so this this theta so that was that so okay uh, so there no nice thing. <laughs> so they proved that theta st h over f is actually an element of qg and for this we don't even need this okay so this t is not needed so this uh, decoration with T or T smoothing is not needed for this particular result. The T smoothing is, uh, of course, very essential for what Casanogas and Delin Rivet do. So if you want something in ZG, we do need T smoothing. And that is what Casanogas and Delin Rivet do. So the method that Casanogas used is a refinement of Shintani's method and the method that Delin Rivet used is in some sense a refinement of Siegel's method. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we have a nice uh, integral element. So this is one side of our our uh, our statement that we want. And on the other side, we want class group. Um, but this time, we are going to take something bigger. Okay. We have this t, and this t is reflected in the choice of the class group. And we are going to take something bigger. Um, uh, and of course, if something bigger is annihilated, then, then the smaller thing will be annihilated. Okay? So, so in fact, we are, we, we are getting a stronger statement. So instead of the usual class group of H, we take the T smooth class group. What does this mean? It means we take uh, the, all the fractional ideals of H, which are co-prime to S and T. So all fractional ideals of H co prime to S and T, but mod them out by only principal fractional ideals where you can choose a generator congruent to one mod all primes in T. Okay, so 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 we we choose only principal ideals which have a generator alpha so that alpha is congruent to one mod every prime in T, uh, which which simply means every prime in T, uh, every prime of of H, which lies above a prime in T. Okay, so this is my shorthand for that. Uh, so you see the usual class group will be a quotient of this group. Okay, so if we if we annihilate uh, this uh, T smooth class group, we we will get an annihilator of the usual class group, but not the other way around uh, in general. So this is uh, in general strictly. 
larger. If you want to think in terms of Galois extensions, then uh, this class group corresponds to uh, maximal abelian extension of H, uh, which is at most tamely ramified at uh, primes in T. Okay, so you rather than having uh, unramified everywhere unramified extension, you get an extension which is uh, where you allow tame ramification in uh, at at places in T. Okay, at, at primes uh, of H above primes in T. All right. So uh, as an analog of uh, um, uh, Stickelberger's theorem, uh, Brumer made the following conjecture. Uh, this was actually in the late 60s. Uh, uh, he, he conjectured that this element, uh, so there's a typo now. I, I don't know, maybe I changed the notation from this point onward. I hope not. Yeah. Um, okay. So he conjectured that uh, this annihilates the T smooth class group. Okay. So this is an analog or even a, a refinement of, of uh, Stickelberger's theorem. Okay. For, for f equal to q, uh, this statement, even this slightly refined statement, just follows from Stickelberger's theorem or, or the same methods. Uh, so anyway, so this is the analog of uh, Stickelberger's theorem for general totally real fields. So this was the statement uh, that Brumer made. Stark made a sort of Stark was trying to understand the leading terms of L values. And so he, he made a conjecture in terms of existence of special elements. Uh, and then it was uh, later it was Tate who realized that the two point of these are sort of two different points of view of the same statement. So, so Tate is the one who combined uh, the work of Brumer and, and Stark. Uh, and so he called it the Brumer-Stark conjecture. Okay, so we'll come to the Stark aspect of this in a minute. Um, but uh, but this, is the, this is the analog, okay? So this is what we are after. Well, what do we know about, about this? So, um, so, so, uh, so the first theorem that I'm going to state today is, is that uh, brumer stark conjecture holds away from two. Okay, so I, I, uh, we can't deal with the, the, uh, the two primary part of, uh, of the class group, but away from that, we know, uh, we know brumer stark conjecture now. Okay, so brumer stark conjecture holds up to two part, which means that theta annihilates uh, the class group tensored with uh, with z one over two. So I, I invert two, which means you know another way of saying this is I throw away the two primary part of the class group, uh, and then theta annihilates that. Okay, uh, there are some uh, real conceptual difficulties in extending our method uh, at two. So uh, so you're trying hard to do it, but it's it's it. I think it it requires. Uh, uh, some new ideas. Um, okay, so it's not just a technical thing that we avoid too, but uh, it's, it's something deeper than that. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the first theorem. Now we come to the Stark aspect of it. So Stark aspect of the of the Brumer Stark conjecture is that there exists some special element, right? So in this particular instance of Stark conjecture, these are analogs of Gauss sums that we uh, saw earlier in the talk. Okay, so um, so what I do is I, I take a prime uh, of F, which is not in S or T, okay? And I fix a prime uh, capital P of H above, oh, sorry, this should be, this should be above uh, small p. Okay, then um, then I, I look at uh, I look at the class of this capital P inside the uh, inside the T smooth class group, and I know that theta um, S T H over F. So I've gone back to my previous notation uh, that annihilates this uh, class of P inside the T smooth class group. And so in particular, I know that this is a principal, uh, this is a principal uh, uh, fractional ideal. And um, not only that, I also know that this U sub P is congruent to one mod T. 
So there's a unique element like this. So our, our conditions on T imply that there is a unique element uh, U sub P of, of this particular form, okay? And this unique element is called the Brumer Stark unit. All right, so, uh, uh, so this is the, the Brumer Stark unit. So Brumer Stark conjecture gives us an existence of this element, okay? So this is the Stark aspect of it. So Stark conjectured that's, that there exists an element in H whose odd is, uh, is given by something, okay? So whose odd is given by L values, right? So if you, yeah, sorry, here's the statement. So if you, if you consider the, uh, the periodic odd of this, then, uh, so if you, if you consider uh, odd sub capital P, of UP, then this is given in terms of L values. So, um, yeah, uh, okay, how do I? Yeah, maybe, maybe another, yeah. So let me write, not write it this way, but, um, So, so let me write it this way, sigma G or sigma inverse UP uh, sigma, this thing is theta S T H over F, okay? So, so the odd of these, uh, the periodic valuation of these elements is given in terms of L values, okay? So this is what uh, Stark conjectured that there exists a unit, there exists an element in H uh, whose periodic valuation is given in terms of H values. So this is the, uh, the star part of it. And I just uh, told you how Brumer aspect of the conjecture implies the star aspect. Uh, and the converse is also true and not hard to prove. So uh, well, there's at least one proof in the talk. All right, so, um, so that's the brumer stark unit. And this is what we are interested in. And why are we interested in, in, in this? Uh, yeah, so it's not a unit. And even in this case, it's not a unit. It, the, the name has just stuck. It's called Brumer Stark unit. It's actually a P unit. Okay, it's unit away from P. There's a question in the chat that it's not a Stickelberger generator you know, over Q is not a unit. And it's not a unit here either, because if it were a unit, then periodic valuation would always be. Uh, be one or or periodic odd would always be zero. That's not the case. So so it is a unit away from P. Okay, it's it's a so called P unit. So that's why it's it's called uh, unit uh, yeah, Brumer Stark unit. So Brumer Stark units are not units. They are P units. And in some sense, that's the reason why we can do anything about it. If it were an honest unit, then we have. There are star conjectures which are about honest units, global units, and we have no idea how to how to approach them actually in general. So because this is a periodic thing, you can actually use periodic methods, which is what we do. All right, thanks. Um, so why why are we interested in this? Well, uh, we can prove the following. So if we um, so so as I said, for H, you could take the uh, maximal. Uh, CM extension of F whose conductor is uh, an integral ideal F, okay? So this is my H now. This is the maximal CM extension whose conductor is, is F. And you look at uh, Brumer Stark units in, in this field. So you choose any P which is co-prime to F and uh, also uh, your, your chosen set T and you look at the Brumer Stark unit in there, you collect all these units for all possible choices of F and you adjoin them to, to F, okay? So you adjoin this infinite set to F, you almost get the full uh, abelian extension of Q, you get the max, uh, sorry, F, you get the maximal abelian extension of F, uh, which is CM, okay? So that's not quite F ab because you have to adjoin some uh, signs. So, so you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, so D here is the degree of, uh, of F over Q. Uh, so you have to adjoin further D minus one elements and these are easy to choose. So, 
so by choosing all uh, yeah so so by joining all these bloomer stark units and these elements which give you signs you uh, uh, you get the maximal abelian extension of f so you don't see these signs when you when you are working over q because uh, yeah okay, you know the maximal abelian extension of q is same as the maximal abelian cm extension of q all right so uh, so, so these Bloomer Stark units they generate abelian. Um, they they almost give you the maximal abelian extension of f. Uh, but the Bloomer Stark conjecture only tells you that uh, these units exist, and it tells you what their odd is. Okay, it tells you what the uh, periodic odd of these units is. Now, knowing odd. Uh, yeah, so so if you if you yeah, so there's a question saying why do we choose d minus one elements? Well, um, so you get so to go from the maximal CM extension of maximal abelian CM extension of F to maximal abelian extension of F, what we miss are are some signs because when you when you want CM extension, you are only um, adjoining sort of roots of uh, elements which are uh, like totally negative. So that's why we we take this. And so we we are missing some signs. So these d minus one elements capture all the signs that we that we want. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so so these Bloomer star these Bloomer Stark units they they give you uh, the maximal abelian extension of f. Um, we know something about their odd. So knowing uh, knowing the periodic odd or periodic valuation of a of a periodic number is is sort of a very weak information. It's like knowing that you you have a point on on a circle and in, in, you have a complex number, you know, even algebraic number on a circle, and you know, you know, the, like you know, you know, it lies somewhere on the circle, right? So, so for a analog in complex number is we we know mod of z, right? So mod of z doesn't tell you where exactly on the circle it is. So it's a bit like that. So um, uh, yeah, so so we know some weak information about it, and we know about its existence. Um, so if we could actually give a formula for this, uh, this uh, Bruma Sark unit, then we can genuinely say we know how to explicitly construct abelian extensions of F, okay? So that's our next uh, order of business. Uh, can we determine this, uh, these, um, these UP explicitly through, in, through some kind of analytic information which is intrinsic to F, right? The, the whole point of Hilbert's problem and the whole point of class field theory is we, we get some uh, information in terms of something which is intrinsic to, to F, okay? So the first step towards this was taken by uh, uh, Cross. So I should set this. Uh, no, I, yeah, yeah, conjecture of Cross, right? So this is not it. Great. Okay. So, um, so what I do now is, uh, well, somehow I, I did not uh, emphasize this point, but only the primes that split completely in H are, are somehow the relevant primes. So from now on, I'm, I'm going to stick to that. This is not a loss of generality at, at all. Um, these are the only relevant things in some sense. So if I choose a different prime, I can just prime which doesn't completely split in H, I'll just change my S. Uh, that's, that's the thing. Okay, so I choose a prime that splits completely in H, okay? And I, I, I join it to my set S. Now I take L to be an extension of, uh, uh, of H, which, uh, which is actually abelian over F. So the whole thing is abelian. This is my G, this is my uh, usual G, and this is my gamma, okay? So, so this is the tower of fields that I'm taking. Now, uh, I'm assuming that L over F is also abelian and it's unramified outside uh, S prime, okay? So, so it's unramified outside the primes in, in S prime, which means that I can define the Stickelberger element for this and it also lives in ZG. So this is again, the application of Delin, Ribet, Kasanovis uh, theorem. So now I have two different Stickelberger elements. <clears throat> now the, the whole the point is that when I uh, when I take this map this augmentation map here, let me call it uh, aug. 
So when I take the augmentation map of theta s prime t l over f, what I get is um, is one minus uh, uh, kind of the the Frobenius um, at p uh, inside you know in, inside g times theta s t h over f. Okay, this is just the usual functorial. Sorry. Oh yeah, why only such primes are relevant? So, uh, well, one way to see this is kind of, if you take all such, if you take primes in H, which are above all such primes P, uh, then that's a density one set. I think that's, that's a short way to answer this. Um, yeah, so, so this thing actually is, is zero because P splits. So this is uh, equal to zero as uh, P splits. Okay, and so this is this is zero. So in fact, this uh, theta s t it, it lives inside uh, i. Okay, so this means that theta s prime t l over f this is an element of my uh, ideal i, the augmentation ideal. Okay, the relative augmentation ideal. All right. So uh, so in particular, I can consider its image in i mod i squared. And I mod I squared, so this is a typo, this should be tensored with ZG, okay? I mod I square, it has a very explicit description. It's, it's more or less like, uh, like a gamma, well, not more, um, yeah, it, it's not quite gamma, it's gamma tensored with ZG, okay? Just as when you take the augmentation ideal, not the relative augmentation ideal, but the augmentation ideal, uh, uh, of, of a group ring ZG, uh, then I mod I square in that case is, is isomorphic to G abelianized, right? So it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Okay, so this is my, my one side of, of the refined uh, conjecture of, of Gross. So this is the, the analytic side of it. So rather than taking the uh, Stickelberger element of the smaller uh, extension. Now we take a bigger extension and we look at the Stickelberger element there. So we, we have lots of choices of L and we, we see what, what more information do these analytic objects give. Okay. And they do give more information. So on the other side, we, instead of taking the odd map, now we take something uh, more complicated. So this is the reciprocity, uh, the look, the, the, the Artin reciprocity map. Okay, so I, I take the p-adic completion of H at, at P. So I fix a prime, a prime capital Gothic P above P. I take p-adic completion. I embed this into the adels of, uh, of H. And then there's the, recip the global reciprocity map, okay? So I call this uh, rest sub P. And I define the following element, okay? So this is my Brumer Stark unit. This is my this is the Brumer Stark unit that we. By the way, I did not say uh, what the what our theorem implies about uh, existence of UP. So because we don't have the theorem at at two uh, to to be actually uh, really correct, I, I'll have to take powers of two in 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 on sort of you know I'll have to multiply both sides by powers of two somehow somehow so. Uh, which is a which is a bit annoying, so I, I kind of just uh, ignored that. So uh, so everything I'm saying is is literally uh, true if if we know the two adic part also of Boomer Stark. Otherwise, I just have to carry um, powers of two everywhere, which is what we do in our in the paper. But uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's tedious to do it, and hopefully we'll have the two adic part also. Uh, so, so then this will this will all be kind of known. Okay, uh, so so this is the Brumer Stark unit. So I I take uh, conjugates. I subtract one. So all these things these are elements in in um, uh, yeah the, the the bracket should be actually here. So okay. Uh, so these are uh, these are elements in. Uh, so this is in gamma. Right. This thing is in gamma. 
So this thing is in gamma. And so I, when I subtract one, this whole thing is in I, and then I'm multiplying it by some lift of, uh, so sigma tilde is actually uh, in Gothic G. So this is, this is an element in I, it's not quite well defined un until you mod it out by I square. Okay, because I'm choosing a lift here, this element is not well defined as an element of I, but it is well defined as an element of I squared, of I mod I squared. Okay, so on this side, I have this well defined uh, element, which is an I mod I square. And remember my theta, my, my bigger theta is also in uh, an element of I. So I can consider it as an element of I mod I square. And the tower of field conjecture that, uh, Gross made, I think it was in about uh, uh, yeah, 1988, is that uh, this reciprocity of, uh, of UP is given by the theta uh, inside I mod I square, okay? So it gives an analytic expression for the reciprocity of UP. Remember, Brumer star gave you um, an analytic expression for periodic odd of UP. Now, uh, this bigger uh, Stickelberger element is giving you an expression for reciprocity map, reciprocity applied to UP. Okay. Uh, well, what does that mean? I mean, what 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 is that giving? Uh, uh, in case of odd, it was clear. It's just telling you about periodic odds. Uh, what uh, you know. What does this give? This looks more complicated. So I'll, I'll tell you in a moment what this gives, uh, but here's the second theorem uh, that I want to mention. So again, we know how to prove this away from, uh, uh, away from two, okay? So, so you take uh, P is an odd. So this statement is all uh, with, with Z, okay, over Z. So what you do is you make a periodic statement and, and then you can prove that periodic state. Instead of Z, you look at ZP, uh, where P is the residue characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of this Gothic P. Uh, and, uh, and that's the statement uh, we can prove, okay? So away from two, we can, uh, we can again prove the statement. Um, uh, yeah, all right. So let me come to, uh, what this actually gives, okay? So as I said uh, many times, Brumer star gives you an information about the periodic order of uh, uh, of Brumer star units. Now, um, for the for uh, Gross's conjecture, we have a choice of L, right? We can choose uh, any L uh, we want, any overextension of H, as long as it's abelian over F. Okay, um, so in particular, I can choose my uh, my um, my uh, L. So yeah, so maybe I, yeah, I should have said here maybe something like um, anyway. Yeah, so L is so my H is in here. Uh, maybe I, I'll take a compositum of this and H. Okay. Uh, all right, so so I can I can take the um, uh, ray class field of conductor uh, p to the n for some large n. You know this n n can vary. Then the residue map, uh, the reciprocity map that I had here. Okay, the reciprocity map here. Um, so remember that actually uh, uh, th this thing is also uh, equal to f sub. P because P splits completely in uh, in H, right? Small P splits completely in H. So the the reciprocity map actually induces an isomorphism like this, okay? Uh, with with, uh, with gamma. So F P mod you take the ring of integers in F P and you take you take principal well you take units in in that congruent to one mod P to the n. So you have to mod out by this. And you have to mod out by the the uh, the group of totally positive p units in in uh, in uh, in um, in f uh, sorry in h okay so this is this is in h okay so this this is a global object 
Okay, this, this thing is a global object. This is local thing. And as n increases, this part kind of disappears, but this part remains. Okay, that's, uh, that's relevant for something I'm going to say uh, in a minute. So uh, in any case, um, uh, wh what I have is, is my gamma actually has this explicit description, okay? And so the, <clears throat> the, the tower of field conjecture that I have here, uh, remember this, this, is, uh, this thing is isomorphic to gamma tensored with uh, uh, Zg, right? So, uh, so the tower of field conjecture, it gives me um, a formula for uh, the, the image under reciprocity in this group. Okay, it gives a formula in this group, but using this, uh, this thing, we get a formula in FP star mod out by this. Okay, so, um, so we get a formula for image of u sub p in f p star mod out by one plus p to the n o p and e p bar, right? So that's the kind of thing we get. Now, as I said, if you keep increasing n, this part will disappear, but this part remains. Well, we can make that part also smaller. So instead of choosing just, uh, f, uh, f uh, p to the n, you can also choose f l times p to the n for various uh, prime uh, primes l. Okay, so, so I, I have inserted this here, which means that my gamma in this case becomes, so I still have this part, but this part is now uh, totally positive p units, which are congruent to one model. Okay, one can, one can show that this is the this is the thing we have to mod out by. So as L is, um, if L is congruent to um, one modulo high power of P, then uh, this thing becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, you know, if, if, that, if L is congruent to one mod P to the M, then this more or less has index uh, P to the M inside this, okay? So by choosing different Ls, we can make this smaller, subsec, uh, you know, smaller and smaller. So, so, so by, by such choice of L, you can get better approximation to UP inside FP star, um, as good an approximation as you want uh, by choosing various Ls. Uh, but that still doesn't quite give you formula for UP because uh, it involves lots of choices of L and, and so on. So uh, your set S keeps changing, et cetera. So the fantastic thing was uh, uh, Samit Gupta actually came up with a conjecture uh, independent of this tower of field conjecture. So, so what he did was uh, he used Eisenstein co-cycles um, or Shintani formula. There are many different ways of looking at this uh, to write down an explicit expression for an element in FP. And he conjectured that that's the Brumer star Q. So, so he wrote down an explicit PIDC analytic formula in FP star, and he conjectured that that's the that's the Brumer star unit. Okay, um, and furthermore, he proved uh, using horizontal Iwasawa theory or what is called Taylor Wiles patching kind of method. Uh, he proved that um, uh, the this family of tower of field conjecture for various choices of L, they actually patch together uh, to, to give his conjecture. There's a mild assumption on, on, on when you cannot, uh, when the proof doesn't work, but it's very mild. So it doesn't really uh, affect the outcome as far as uh, application to Hilbert's 12th problem is concerned. Uh, so, so he proved that, uh, that um, the tower of field conjecture or, or kind of this theorem, uh, in infinitely many, you need it in infinitely many cases, but that implies uh, his conjecture. So, so the expression, the periodic analytic expression that he wrote down does indeed give you Brumer Stark unit. Okay. Um, so these Eisen, uh, yeah, let me just finish by saying these Eisenstein co cycles are now uh, 
much studied object. So they kind of their study started with Czech and uh, Nori, and then uh, uh, later on um, uh, Das Gupta, Matt Greenberg, and so on uh, used them. And now, uh, yeah, Akshay Venkatesh and uh, Nicola Bergeron and so on have papers on this. So this is quite a interesting topic which has gained a lot of uh, interest in recent times so um, yeah all right so I, I don't have any time to say anything about the proof so I'll, I'll stop here thank you